a real-life story that inspired Game of Thrones and the castle at the center of centuries of epic power struggles. Every Englishman and woman knows the tale of the Battle of Hastings in 1066, where a stray arrow brought down a king, and in consequence, an entire kingdom. This event shaped the course of English history forever. What is often left out are the preceding wars of William the Conqueror on his path to defeating King Harold. However, it is the wars that followed this saga involving William's descendants that were so epic and served as the inspiration for House of the Dragon. The significance of Pevensey Castle doesn't end there. It started as one of the most powerful Roman bases in Britain. In the late medieval period, it once again played a central role in a power struggle during the Second Barons' War, one of the many English civil wars. 290. Step back in time to the days of ancient Rome, where the thrilling tale of Carasius, a British Roman Navy commander, unfolds against the stunning backdrop of Pevensey Castle. This majestic structure, once a humble fort known as Anderitum, evolved into a formidable defense system guarding Britain's coastline against the formidable might of the Imperial forces during a momentous rebellion. The original fort can only be imagined today, but it would have likely been a wooden palisade with a Roman presence of buildings inside. Carasius, a charismatic figure in history, would not be confined to a mere navy commander. His audacious ambition led him to declare himself Emperor of Britain and Northern Gaul in 286, forever altering the course of history by breaking the long-standing connection between the Roman Empire and Britain. But with great power comes great peril, and corruption allegations would bring Carasius to the brink of destruction. As the drama of this extraordinary narrative unfolds, we witness Emperor Maximian's chilling decision to order Carasius's execution, casting a shadow of doom over the man who dared to challenge the Roman Empire. The rebellion's high-stakes climax would ultimately see Carasius meet a tragic end at the hands of his very own troops. Electus, a trusted member of Carasius' forces, would go down in history as the man who sealed the commander's fate. The dramatic conclusion to this rebellion in 296 marked a pivotal moment in the history of Pevensey Castle. With the ties severed between Britain and the Roman Empire, the castle's fate took a new turn. Its once formidable walls, designed to withstand the test of time, saw their condition deteriorate. However, the castle would not fade into oblivion. It transformed into a sprawling, Oval fortress occupying an impressive ten acres, making it one of the grandest Roman forts ever to grace the British landscape. 395. In the 4th century, a new military command was established, breathing fresh life into the defense of Pevensey Castle. This was a time of both challenge and resurgence, where the resilience of the fortress was on full display. For those seeking insight into the complexities of the Roman Empire during this era, the Notitia Dignitium becomes an invaluable resource. This scripted record of Roman documents meticulously listed all the civil and military posts within the vast expanse of the Roman Empire. Within its pages, Pevensey Castle, alongside eight other forts, found its place in history, a Roman version of the Doomsday Book, if you will. The significance of Pevensey Castle's inclusion in the Notitia Dignitium is profound. It serves as a reminder of the strategic importance of this formidable fortress, not just for the Roman Empire, but for all who ventured to challenge its might. These Roman stone forts in Roman Britain mostly followed a similar design, as with Porchester Castle, another Roman fort in the south of England. A stone wall covering a large area, with towers standing at regular intervals, with the addition of multiple gatehouses. Unlike medieval castles, the only stone structures would have been the defensive walls and towers. Within the walls would have been an array of timber buildings such as a sprawling barracks complex. The towers and gatehouses would likely have crowned a tiled roof, providing some level of luxury for guards within the towers. The reason for the lack of stone structures is a deeper, more in-depth examination of historic periods. Essentially, the Romans built forts solely for military use, whereas during the medieval periods, castles served as multifunctional hubs. They acted not only as military bases, but also 
as residences for lords and royalty, centers for markets, places of worship, courthouses, prisons, and much more. Perhaps I will create a video exploring the evolution or devolution of castles and military bases at another time, as the study shapes historical trends and potentially influences our future one day. 471 to 491 as the Roman legions bid farewell to these ancient walls, a band of brave individuals stepped in to occupy the Pevensey Fort. They were no ordinary settlers, but guardians, poised to fend off the relentless scourge of pirate raids that threatened their existence. These brave souls, determined to make this fortress their sanctuary, stood as the last line of defense against the chaos of the time. But, as history often unfolds, challenges persisted. Saxon forces, with their indomitable spirit, launched an attack on the fort's defenders. A fierce battle ensued, and the outcome was a tragic one. The Saxons emerged victorious, their victory stained with the blood of the brave inhabitants who had fought valiantly. With the fortress now under Saxon control, a new chapter in its history was about to begin. If we step back in time to that intriguing era, we discovered that what we now know as Pevensey Castle would not have existed. The Roman walls and formidable gatehouses might have stood tall and proud, though it's tough to envision them being quite as meticulously maintained as they were during the Roman heyday. You see, those were darker times following the gradual decline of the mighty Roman Empire. Nevertheless, launching an assault on this fortress was no easy feat, a real conundrum for both the Saxons and those daring seafaring pirates. Defensive structures, like a stone wall, were exceedingly rare in Britain during those days, and siege weapons, if they existed at all, would likely have proven futile against those stout stone walls. Now, what could have tipped the scales in favor of an attacking force was the sheer grandeur of the fort. Picture this, a sprawling expanse of ten acres. It might have been a situation where manning and defending the entire wall posed quite the challenge for a modest community. After all, it was originally designed to house a Roman garrison. Archaeological traces from this era unveil the fort's high status character during the Saxon era. Glass fragments and other artifacts serve as clues to its importance and the life that once thrived within its formidable walls. The Saxons would not remain the sole keepers of this fortress. After a period of Saxon occupation, they eventually abandoned Pevensey Fort, and as if guided by fate, the sands of time brought forth new inhabitants to the grounds. The fort, now layered with history and stories of conquest and survival, continued to evolve. 1066, step back into the pivotal year 1066, a time when the fate of Pevensey Castle was forever intertwined with the grand tapestry of history. William, Duke of Normandy, led his formidable army through the ancient Roman walls on a fateful September day. This monumental invasion came hot on the heels of King Harold II's victorious campaign at Stamford Bridge. As the Anglo-Saxon forces shifted to northern Yorkshire, William and his troops descended upon Pevensey Castle. Upon their arrival, William, a master strategist, wasted no time in fortifying his position. He constructed a temporary camp within the fortress's walls, using cunning tactics to protect his army. With deliberate intent, William ordered the creation of a ditch that sliced across the peninsula, distinctly marking the original land from the castle's ruins. These ruins were painstakingly restored by William and his men. Additionally, William oversaw the construction of Hastings Castle to the east of Pevensey, further solidifying his dominance over the region. As the castle's development continued to unfold, William the Conqueror, a name that resonates as one of the most important in British history, led his army to confront King Harold's troops in the iconic Battle of Hastings. The outcome of this battle would shape the course of British history as William emerged victorious, claiming his place in English history, and the last time England was ever successfully invaded by a foreign power. In the aftermath of his success, William the Conqueror bestowed upon Pevensey Castle a significant legacy. He granted the rape, a stretch of land next to the coast, as well as a substantial portion of Sussex, to his half-brother Robert, Count of Mortain. Robert took up the mantle of overseeing the administration of the castle, and embarked on a grand transformation. The castle's metamorphosis was profound. 
Robert, Count of Mortain, not only revitalized the ancient walls, but reconstructed them, breathing new life into the old fortifications. The old Roman wall, a silent witness to centuries of history, now became the outer bailey for the castle. The inner bailey's boundaries took shape with a moat and an imposing timber palisade. The castle, under Robert's watchful eye, evolved into a symbol of authority, governance, and strength. 1087. The year 1087 ushered in a moment of profound change in the legacy of Pevensey Castle. This chapter and its storied history was marked by the passing of the indomitable William the Conqueror. The towering figure, who had fortified and transformed the fortress, breathed his last, leaving behind a profound impact on the course of history. In his wake, William left three remarkable children, each poised to inherit their father's legacy and shape their own destinies. The trio of inheritors consisted of Robert Curthos, William Rufus, and Henry, each destined for greatness. Robert Curthos, the eldest, would ascend to the title of Duke of Normandy, inheriting a powerful legacy of rule and governance. William Rufus, the second son, took up the mantle of power as William II of England. His reign would be marked by challenges and triumphs, a reflection of the dynamic era in which he lived. Henry, the youngest, would emerge as King Henry I of England, cementing his status as a monarch of great influence and authority. His reign would become a defining period in England's history, shaping the nation's path for years to come. Pevensey Castle, once a strategic jewel in William the Conqueror's crown, continued to stand as a testament to the legacy of a remarkable era. 1088. The year 1088 was a whirlwind of treachery and rebellion at Pevensey Castle, setting the stage for a gripping chapter in its history. The ambitious Robert, Duke of Normandy, cast his sights on the English throne, igniting a power struggle that would shake the foundations of the castle's ancient walls. In a daring move, Robert sought to seize his brother William II's throne, plunging the kingdom into chaos. To support his audacious bid for power, Robert found allies in the form of the Count of Mortain and his brother Odo, Bayeux's bishop. Together, they conspired to challenge the established order and held Pevensey Castle against William II's forces. The tension mounted as William Rufus, the beleaguered king, caught wind of the plot against him. In a swift and decisive response, he rallied royal forces and laid siege to the castle. The imposing fortifications of Pevensey held firm against the onslaught, their defenders displaying unwavering courage in the face of adversity. Weeks turned into months as the siege wore on. Pevensey Castle's formidable garrison held their ground with tenacity, but even the mightiest walls cannot stand forever. Six weeks later, the castle's defenders faced the harsh reality that their supplies had run out leaving them with no choice but to yield to the relentless pressure from William Rufus. A well-manned fort, defiant and resolute, stood as a formidable challenge for the relentless besiegers. Within the inner castle, a wooden keep and palisade guarded the heart of the stronghold, while the age-old Roman walls, meticulously preserved by the occupying forces, formed an impregnable bulwark during this protracted siege. The besieging army, strategically positioned at various points along the outer walls, orchestrated their moves to dominate the northern and southern gates. It wasn't an all-out brawl. Instead, it was a game of cunning patience designed to starve the enemy into submission. Picture regular, daring attempts to breach the gates and scale the walls, a psychological battle that tested the defenders' resolve to the limit. Yet, for such protracted sieges to work, one crucial factor had to be in the attackers' favor. They had to be firmly ensconced in friendly or home territory. You see, when you're laying siege to a stronghold for an extended period, you'd better be darn sure there are no allies or reinforcements lurking in the shadows, poised to ride to the rescue of the beleaguered garrison. That's why not all sieges revolved around the attrition game of starving out the defenders. It was a thrilling dance on the precipice of power and strategy where every move could tip the scales. In a twist of fate, the Count of Mortain was granted the right to retain control of Pevensey, a testament to the intricate web of alliances and rivalries that shaped the politics of the time. Allow me to interrupt for a brief moment. On this channel, I am dedicated to serving 
and preserving historical accuracy for generations to enjoy. Medieval history is, well, spotty at best. If you hear anything you believe is inaccurate, or think I am missing any important information in this video, please leave a comment for the educational purposes of myself and my audience. 1090 to 1130. Enter the years of 1090 to 1130, a time when Pevensey Castle's legacy continued to be shaped by the relentless winds of change, intrigue, and power struggles. The fortress, perched on the edge of history, witnessed the rise and fall of mighty dynasties, as well as the captivating tale of those who called it home. The stage was set for the next chapter as Robert's son, William, stepped into the role of guardian of the castle. However, ambition and rebellion were not far behind. William, like his predecessors, sought to defy the established order, leading a rebellion against the formidable Henry I. The result was a high-stakes conflict that would forever alter the course of Pevensey Castle's history. In the year 1102, Pevensey Castle found itself in the hands of Gilbert de Elagle. Yet, it was a name from the church that would become synonymous with the castle's history during this era. Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, took refuge within the fortress. His stay within its walls was spurred by his close relationship with Gilbert's son, Richard, and his need for sanctuary during a tumultuous period. 1135 to 1147. Buckle up for a thrilling ride through the years 1135 to 1147, as Pevensey Castle finds itself at the heart of a gripping tale of power, betrayal, and transformation. These years were marked by the aftermath of Henry I's death, and the castle became a pivotal player in a high-stakes Game of Thrones. With Henry I's passing came a dilemma. The king had left no male heir to inherit his kingdom. This power vacuum ignited a civil war, with two contenders stepping into the arena to claim the coveted seat of power. On one side stood Henry I's daughter, Matilda, and on the other, his nephew, Stephen. The clash of their ambitions would shape the destiny of Pevensey Castle. Stephen, fueled by his own determination to seize the throne, confiscated the possessions of Henry I, including the prized lands of the castle. A twist of fate added another layer of complexity to the story when Stephen handed these lands over to Gilbert de Clare, Earl of Pembroke. This decision would have far-reaching consequences, as Gilbert de Clare would soon wed Matilda, further intertwining the castle's fate with the ever-shifting allegiances of the era. It is this war between Matilda and Stephen that set the stage for George Martin's House of the Dragon. The death of King Henry playing the role of King Viserys, and his death symbolizing the same power vacuum left by King Henry. In the year 1147, Pevensey Castle bore witness to a dramatic transformation. Hilbert de Clare, now in a position of power and influence, took a decisive step by ordering a siege of the castle. The once mighty fortress, which had witnessed so much history, was now brought under the control of the crown, becoming a symbol of royal authority. 1180 to 1230. 1180 to 1230 was a time when the fortress underwent a remarkable evolution. In the reign of the legendary Richard I, otherwise known as Richard the Lionheart, where you can also think of him as the lion in Disney's Robin Hood movie. Oh, yeah, King Richard! Pevensey Castle entered a new era of development. In the 1190s, under the watchful eye of Richard, the castle's first stone fortifications began to take shape. The crowning jewel of this construction effort was the imposing Great Keep, a structure that would become a symbol of strength and authority within the castle's walls. This castle now resembled other castles in medieval Britain, with a keep at the heart of the castle serving multiple purposes, luxury residences, a military and political headquarters, and the center of a bustling settlement. Like all castle settlements, this one included a far-reaching array of buildings such as taverns, stables, blacksmiths, kitchens, chapels, lodgings, and much more as the keep became a permanent and vital structure for the crown. Communities would have flocked to the site and settled in and around the walls. Castles in this period served as a safe haven for everyone, knowing that protection could always be found, as the next invading force or civil uprising was always close by. Fast forward to 1216, 
and the castle's resilience would be tested in a fiery clash. Richard found himself pitted against Prince Louis, the son of the French king, in a high-stakes battle to fend off an invasion. The ensuing war would exact a toll on Pevensey Castle, resulting in damage that would later need repair. During this period, we know that there was a wooden palisade and a ditch around the keep, providing an inner defensive structure. In 1230, a pivotal transition took place as Gilbert Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, took the reins of Pevensey Castle. Under his stewardship, the fortress continued its transformation, but it was Peter of Savoy who would leave an indelible mark on the castle. With a vision of grandeur, he embarked on an ambitious project to upgrade the castle's defenses. One of the most significant changes was the replacement of the timber palisade with a formidable stone wall, fortifying the castle and ensuring its enduring strength. Only now did Pevensey Castle resemble what we see on site today. 1264 to 1399. The years 1264 to 1399 at Pevensey Castle saw rebellion, sieges, and dramatic transformations unfurled like an epic saga of yore. Simon de Montfort, the formidable Earl of Leicester, stands at the helm of a rebellion against the formidable Henry II, leading the charge in the Second Baron's War. In a seismic clash of wills, Montfort emerges victorious at the Battle of Luz in 1264. However, Montfort's path was not without obstacles. He set his sights on the castle, a stronghold known for its formidable defenses. Yet, even with his strategic brilliance, Montfort's efforts to conquer the castle were thwarted by its indomitable defense forces, leaving the fortress standing tall. Even if the Roman walls were breached, what lay beyond was a medieval marvel, a daunting citadel ready to thwart any attack. It boasted all the bells and whistles of medieval defenses, turning it into an impenetrable maze of fortifications that would make any invader's heart race. Just picture it. A moat surrounding the castle, a treacherous expanse that made ladders and towers useless. The only route to the gate, a narrow bridge, a lethal funnel where archers could rain down a storm of projectiles with pinpoint accuracy. Towering sentinels dotted the castle, each one bristling with strategically placed arrow slots, covering every possible angle of attack. Crenellations lined the walls, providing vital protection for the brave defenders perched atop their eyes sharp, and their bows ready. And let's not forget the ingenious additions, putt logs, and double holes, which made timber machicolations possible. These allowed the defenders to rain down a hail of objects onto the hapless invaders, turning the battlefield into a nightmare. But the piece de resistance was the full-blown medieval gatehouse, complete with a menacing portcullis and murder holes, ramming the gate. Near impossible, this fortress was a living testament to the ingenuity and unwavering resolve of medieval engineers, a thrilling fortress that had the attackers facing the ultimate test of valor and cunning. Fast forward to 1268, and Pevensey Castle underwent a change of hands. Following the death of Peter of Savoy, the castle returned to royal ownership, marking a new chapter. But, alas, it would face challenges of its own. The castle's fate took a downturn, as it grappled with the harsh conditions of the coastal region, its dilapidated structures, and commanders tainted by corruption. These challenges would test the metal of the fortress and the spirit of those within. Enter John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, a central figure in the castle's narrative. However, a fateful decision saw him provoke Richard II's instructions, leading his military troops against a French attack. The consequence was dire as Pevensey Castle fell victim to sack and ruin. But as history often does, it offers redemption. In 1399, the castle found itself on the path to restoration, transforming into a state prison with a renewed sense of purpose. 1406, as the years rolled on, Pevensey Castle, once a symbol of strength, was left to the elements, a silent witness to history. It stood aloof during the Wars of the Roses, and as a result, its mighty walls began to crumble and decay. The castle's formidable presence was all but forgotten, as the world around it changed. But, as fate often dictates, the castle would rise from its slumber to play a role in a new chapter of history. In the early 1400s, Pevensey Castle 
became a state prison, a place of intrigue, an enigma. One of its most famous captives was none other than King James I of Scotland and Joan of Navarre. They were accused of plotting the death of Joan's stepson by witchcraft, a story that reads like a dark and mysterious tale from the past. 1587. Fast forward to the late 16th century, and the castle faced an ominous threat. In 1587, the specter of a Spanish invasion loomed large. Elizabeth I, a monarch known for her foresight and resolve, took swift action. Emergency repairs were made to fortify the crumbling fortress, and a formidable gun installation was constructed within the outer bailey. Heavensea Castle would once again be pressed into service, not as a prison, but as a guardian of the realm, defending the coast against foreign invaders. At this time, the use of early gunpowder weapons necessitated the construction of newer castles with much thicker walls than Pevensey could ever boast. This shift gave rise to an entirely new evolution of castle design. While the Tudors erected numerous fortresses along the southern English coast, these older fortresses received only limited defensive additions. 1940 the year 1940 marked a remarkable and unexpected resurrection in the long history of Pevensey Castle. After languishing in neglect for over 400 years, the castle's walls were thrust back into the forefront of history, transformed into a fortress once more. This time, it wasn't knights in shining armor who stood guard, but the defenders of an entire nation in the face of a dire threat. As the ominous clouds of World War II gathered, the Nazi threat of invasion loomed large over the British Isles. In this precarious moment, Pevensey Castle was called back into action. The old fortress was reanimated with a renewed sense of purpose. Its defenders wasted no time, adding a significant number of machine gun posts to its strategic positions, fortifying its defenses. One of the most iconic features of this wartime transformation was the construction of a crucial observation post perched atop the castle's formidable walls. From this vantage point, the defenders could keep a watchful eye on the surrounding landscape, ready to sound the alarm in the event of enemy incursions. The machine gun posts, each a sentinel of defense, were a symbol of the resolute spirit of those who manned them. Their presence served as a stark reminder of the importance of the castle in the defense of the realm. But, like many remnants of war, the defenses eventually succumbed to the ravages of time, their structures dismantled during the tumultuous years of the conflict. Heavensey Castle's World War II chapter is a testament to its enduring significance and its ability to rise to the challenges of different eras. Today, as you explore the castle, you can still glimpse the traces of this unexpected wartime revival, reminding us that history is never truly dormant, and that even ancient stones can be called upon to play a role in the dramatic narrative of human events. Perhaps we today should never take our peace for granted, as these castles, stone walls, first witnessed war 1700 years ago, and yet still bear witness to a war that lives in the memory of people still alive today. Now, let's transport ourselves to Duffus Castle, to the far northern regions of the British Isles, where the countless power struggles of war, rebellion, and warring families were just as prevalent. If the bloody and non-stop history of Pevensey Castle left you captivated, I promise that Duffus Castle's history will have the same effect. Click here on your screen to watch this video now.